like, I want to do what that is. Jamal Meg, you know, they were like poets who were really formative for me. So I learned poetry uh, and got into Poetry Slam because that's where poetry was happening. I didn't really care much about the format of Poetry Slam. That's just where all the poets I loved were doing what they were doing. And so it was important for me to be on their level. And through that, I kind of learned uh, lyricism that I could place into my work. And so, you know, how did you, you know, they'll, they'll learn this as they read it, but how did you infuse both of those? Um, in, how did you infuse all of that into your book? Because it's because at some points it's lyrical, at other points it's uh, poetic, um, and other parts it's narrative, and it, and it switches back and forth between the two. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's, it's for me. It's a, um, I think it's just what my writing style is now, and how it's been. You know, I, I don't. Um, yeah, I, for me, the voice should evolve. Like, I know there are a lot of writers in the room, and the voice should evolve, undoubtedly. But once you have a formula that's effective for you, for me at least, it's been easy to just kind of lend as many things as I can through that formula uh, and see where it takes me. This book was a bit of a leap. I mean, this book was formally a bit of a leap, structurally a bit of a leap. Um, harder to do, I think, harder, harder to make. Um, but not without its pleasures. I'm really after, like writing has to be pleasurable for me. And it's pleasurable for me when I do get to play around with language in the way that I, that I can on the page. Um, when I do get to take something that seems ordinary and make it extraordinary through, just through language, through image, through metaphor. Writing has to, has to have some source of pleasure, I think, yeah. And, and so I was, I was going to ask um, a little bit later, what your favorite passage was to write. But since you talked about it being difficult at times, what was the most difficult part for you um, as you were writing this book? Well, I think for me, you know, the most difficult part is always, um, well, that's not true. For this book, the most difficult part was the structure. Figuring out the, the time clock thing, the idea of the, the the, the book is, for those who don't know or have not read, I feel like by now many people know, the book is structured like a basketball game. Um, is that a Holy Font sweatshirt? I was just listening to that, that um, one of my favorite songs in the world is the song True Lost. I was listening to that on the way up. Beautiful song. I love that band. Um, it's hard, I think, I was making something I've never seen before. You know, I've never seen a book that looked like this book. And in a way, that was really challenging for me because for the first, I would say, 20,000 words of it, it was a lot of doubt and second, second guessing, and I think I was becoming beholden to the clock structure and using that to avoid challenging myself linguistically. But then I realized, I'm making something that doesn't exist, so therefore I can't really fail. Or at least I don't, there's no blueprint for failure that exists. If this doesn't exist, then no blueprint for failure exists. And so my range with which I can play is very wide, perhaps as wide as it's ever been in any book. That doesn't mean that I could not fail on a language level or I could not fail, but I wouldn't know what that is until I actually really took a big swing. And to have that attached to it made it a lot easier. It was so cleansing. It was such a, a cleansing and freeing experience to say, the ways that I can fail are, are shrinking by the moment. Um, you know, obviously there, there are basketball overtones to, to your book, which, you know, as a basketball fan, I, I certainly enjoyed. Um, but for... Um, those out here who are non-basketball fans, what did you want them to learn or to um, get out of your out of your book? You know, I really, I really wanted to make something that was like a mirror for people, or like something where you walk to a body of water and look in the body of water, and what is reflected back to you is what you most want to see. And that means that I do think that if you are a basketball fan, you will come to this book and you will find basketball in it, and you will love the basketball in it. I think, hopefully. If you are someone who is interested in considering mortality and time, you'll see that in it, for sure. If you're someone who's interested in place and the responsibilities one has to place, or lack of responsibility one has to place, you'll see that. If you're someone who's interested in the complications of a relationship between a parent and a child, I think you'll see that. And, and for me, it wasn't even a, a... Early on in the book, I think I was trying to measure each of those out equally. I was trying to actually avoid this idea that it would be sold or treated as a quote-unquote basketball book. 
But then I realized that it was just happening organically. The more I wrote, the more I was writing away from these strict and rigid binaries of aboutness. And I was writing into something a lot more full and, and flourishing and complete. Um, again, um, I'm going to go back to what was your favorite passage to write? I know, you know, you obviously write a lot about LeBron James and, and you know, and you weave him all throughout uh, this, this entire book. But what was the, your most favorite passage and, and why is it the most favorite passage for you? Um, well, there are two. What, can I read a little later? Yes, you certainly can. Okay, I'll uh, read, I'll uh, read uh, one. Uh, of course. But the other one I want to talk about is there's a very small part of the book. Has anyone read the book by a show of hands? Cool, thank y'all for reading so far. But there's a very small part of the book that took a long time to complete, which was, um, you know what's wild about this book is that it used to be upside down, so I sometimes forget. I mean, literally, quarter four used to be quarter one content-wise, so I sometimes forget if this is in the first quarter or the fourth quarter, because <laughs> I don't, I have not read it uh, myself. <laughs> I read, like, I, I wrote it, so it's like I read it, but not like, you know, I don't really need to read the book. You didn't read the whole thing. I, yeah. I, I, if you're a writer, you understand. Yeah, I'm not, I was there. I, 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 don't, I don't read my columns in the paper. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got my feet on the couch like that. Uh, there's this part in either quarter one or quarter four where I take the word gang and kind of rewire it about 10 different times. And the portion, the part of that that was challenging was one, to get it rhythmically right and lyrically right, but two, it's attempting to do a thing. It's actually attempting to do something. The word gang was never threatening to me when I was a child. Um, or as, a, as a, an adult even. You know, the, the gangs in my neighborhood, for example, in the most literal sense, were protectors of the neighborhood. They were very loving. They were very, it meant gang, and it could be a term of affection for me. Like in, with my punk friends, it was like my, the black punks that I had, the black punks in Detroit, for example, who I would see when we come up here to the shelter and shit like that. That was kind of a mode of affection for us. And so I wanted to play with this idea that if we say a word enough times, it begins to, people say it becomes meaningless, but that's actually not what happens. It loses its form. It, which isn't meaningless. It actually gains more meaning as the form becomes more flimsy. And so there's a part in the first or fourth quarter. I think it got moved to the first. Uh, no, it's in the fourth. Because I read out of it, I think that could be wrong. Either way, there's this part where I kind of begin, you know, gang everywhere, and then I deconstruct the word gang. Uh, and it ends with a friend of mine saying, I'm going to have me a gang of kids, and my kid's going to have a gang of kids. And I, I, that was hard to write because I was attempting, I was really attempting something a kind of formlessness around language that some would consider dangerous. And I think I was trying to echo that to the front of the book, where I was talking about how enemies, our enemies, have no access to our affections, and therefore they're afraid of them, right? And so that, it was hard to transfer that idea into something that small, that small paragraph. So that one paragraph took me like a day to get right. Um, which I suppose, you know, people have labored over it took like six and a half months to record just the song for to run, you know what I mean? So people have labored over more. Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, one passage really early that caught my attention was um, the part about Kenny Gregory. Yeah. Um, and he was a superstar in your guy. Um, yeah. And as a basketball guy, first of all, I want to um, pay homage to obviously today is uh, the day of the Final Four, but uh, we lost one of our basketball greats here, um, yeah. Wimp, um, who was a high school All-American, um, and um, he died today. Um, and so um, it, it, I think you know nothing happens by by happenstance. And so talk a little bit about. Um, a little bit about the passage about Kenny Gregory and just sort of what he meant um, for your neighborhood and what it meant for him to to get out and to succeed. Yeah, I don't know if people remember him as a, as a player, but he was like the All-American, the McDonald's All-American MVP in 97, won the dunk contest, played at Kansas, um, was all Big 12, maybe even All-American. Didn't get drafted though. All-American, yes. He was All-American, yeah. 
did get drafted in the NBA, played overseas. I actually just saw Kenny. I saw Kenny three weeks ago. I was doing a photo shoot at Scottwood, the park we grew up playing in. And he just walked over with his kid. They were playing soccer on the pitch, you know, like he's, he's still in the neighborhood, which is beautiful to me. Um, but I, this book is attempting to redefine what making it is in some ways, or to reconsider what we mean when we say they made it. Um, if you, there are kids now on courts in Columbus who were not alive when Kenny Gregory played, like at all. And if you say his name, they still revere his name, even if they've never seen him. Sure, I'm certain Kenny would take the NBA seven, the NBA checks or whatever, but that is making it in a way. If you are revered and beloved in the place where you made your name, you have made it, I think. And those stories deserve as much attention as the kind of making it in the material sense that we rely on, like he made it to the league or she made it to the league or, you know, you see, I think of, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a women's hoop fan too, you know, and I think about the W specifically and how few roster slots there are in the WNBA, like for real. There are incredible players in college, in women's ball, who are just not gonna make the league a lot because there's just not enough spots to make the league at the same, it's not like the NBA where you can have like a, you know, a second round 50 something is pick maybe flourish. It's like, if you're not in those first like 12 to 15, if you look at say the, the WNBA All-Star team rosters, I would encourage y'all to do this. Look at WNBA All-Star team rosters over the past, I don't know, decade, and look at how many players were drafted outside of the top seven. There's like two. That's what the margins are. And so we have to have a different idea of making it because infrastructurally, uh, not just in women's ball, but let's use women's ball as a metric. Infrastructurally, there are a lot of talented people who aren't going to make it, but who maybe did something large on a big stage and made their community proud, and that in a way is making it. And, and that sort of brings me to um, my next question is how you use basketball metaphors to address these larger issues, whether it was love, um, and we're living in the past 25 years old. Yeah. Um, as you as you're talking about, you know, this making it and what it means, and for for many African American men, um, making it is living past 25 years old. And so, talk about how you use um, those those. Very kind thing, and it makes sense to think about how like. I wasn't sure I would love this book because I haven't played basketball since I was a kid because basketball is what me and my friends did to feel close to each other. And I thought, oh, that's not actually, that's, uh, yes, that's, I hear you, but that's exactly actually what it was for me too. Sure, I kept playing or what have you, but like that is what it was for me. It was just me and my friends saying, we want to be close to each other. And I think to this degree now, still, it's me and my friends saying, we want to be close to each other. I play basketball with my friends like once, a, like a certain group of friends once a year, like older friends. And then I play a little more frequently with a group of young writers who I mentor and work with, who are like anywhere between 17 and 22. Um, and there's a difference in those two settings for me. One is like, I know I should have my foot up on this shit. Uh, <laughs> What is me saying, like, I am attempting not to recapture any of my youth, but just to see what I can still do, you know what I mean? And the other one is me saying, I can be my full self around you all with nothing to prove, because we are all attempting and reaching for the same thing. We are reaching for a level of closeness with each other through this, like, once a year, one summer, because a lot of my friends are like, I'm talking about my friends who are like poets and writers and shit, like, they live everywhere, so we, like, convene in upstate New York for, like, a day, and we play a game of ball. Um, and that's something beautiful to me, I think, that allows me to revel in my still being here and allows me to revel in the presence of the people I love, not that differently than I did when I was a kid. It's just kind of amplified by 10, sometimes 20, depending on how much I'm aging. And so, yeah, I think about that a lot. I think about how cleansing it feels, sure, to play with uh, a group of like 17 to 22 year olds and still be able to, you know, they don't really take care of themselves, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm a runner, so I run, I run a lot too much probably. And at some point, uh, for those of us who are elder millennials, uh, 
That call you get, like if you have the stamina to run up and down the court, you're gonna be okay. Cause like these kids don't, they don't be taking care of themselves all like that. You know what I mean? Coughing, wheezing, and all that. And so in some ways, I just have the stamina to endure, <laughs> to endure game basketball people younger than me. But yeah, I think basketball is the way I, it's still a translation tool for me. Um, and you talked about briefly about having nothing to prove. Yeah. Um, as a writer. Um, how did that give you the the confidence to to be able to put this on paper and put this out and uh, out into the world? Um, because obviously, um, the the best tool as a journalist or as a writer is your confidence. And so, having how much of not having nothing to prove um, is reflected on um, upon what uh, people will see in this. Well, I don't know. I mean, as a writer, I have everything to prove. As a writer, I feel like I have a lot to prove. Um, um, and why is that? Well, because... I mean, as, as someone who has been on New York Times bestseller list and all of that stuff, I mean, you would... But that doesn't matter. That's not what... You but, know. but again, it goes back to what you were saying about making it. Right? Sure. And so... Um, why, why is that? But the decoration, like all that shit, that's not a legacy, you know? That's, that, that's just decoration. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for whatever. I mean, we, we, you know, like, I say we because I think it's a collective action. Like, we work for these, like, we work for that. Like, I did not give a New York Times bestseller alone, right? Uh, but I'm saying, like, as a writer, whether I choose it or not, and I think I've chosen it, but whether I, if I even I did, I'm operating within a lineage. Do you understand? I'm operating within a lineage of other writers. I'm an Ohioan, so that means I'm operating in Morrison's lineage. I'm operating in the lineage of Yona Harvey, in the lineage of, to some extent, like St. Hughes, even, you know, I, I have to try carefully around like St. Hughes, uh, <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I mean, I'm in these lineages. I'm in the lineage of, of writers that I love who inform me. Miss Gwendolyn Brooks. I'm in the lineage of um, Robert Hayden. So what I'm saying is, and I'm in a lineage of living writers who I must, by default, rise to the occasion of loving well through my work. I'm in the lineage of Kyle Akbar. I'm in the lineage of E. Ewing. I'm in the lineage of Ross Gay. All of this is important. So what I'm saying is, I'm competitive not because I want to win things, or you know, I'm competitive not because I want to succeed. I'm competitive because I want to be good because I'm operating alongside people who demand demand me to be at least working towards a kind of goodness that they are working towards. And I'm working in a lineage of writers, black writers specifically, who I love and who loved me through their work before I before they even knew I existed. And in some cases before they did, you know, lived a life where they didn't know I existed. Toni Morrison loved me through her work, even not knowing that I was a person, right? And so I am competitive and I have a lot to prove as a writer, not because I want to be better than anyone, but because I want to be good for these people. And I want to be good for the lineage that I am operating in, because it would be I would be operating in it whether I wanted to or not. And I want to be good for anyone who might stumble upon my work through the love they have for the writers I'm orbiting around. The decoration stuff is fine, but no one's going to remember it. No one's going to remember that. I don't remember. I can't name one other New York Times bestseller from last week, and I was on the. You know what I mean? Like I don't remember. Uh, You're going to, you're, we're all required to die. That's the reality, right? And when we die, I pray that for all of us, the things we've won or our decorations are not what are spoken of. We are, have, we are required to operate. All of us operate within the lineage, even if we're not creating things. We're operating in a lineage of people who care for us and who want us to love the world in the way that they have led us to. That's what is left behind, and that is what I think is, is that I have a lot to prove, I have a lot to live up to, because, um, you know, Toni Morrison didn't stop, like, you know, Toni Morrison's, Toni Morrison's early books, she wrote some of the best books in history, she could have just stopped, but she didn't. Um, so, I had to be cut from that claw. Okay. Um, and before I get to the questions out, out here, um, I received a question a little bit earlier while we were waiting on you, and it was about what was my writing process. 
Um, and how do you go about writing it? And the one thing that I failed to mention is that you don't ever start with the top of your story all the time. Yeah. And, and it's not a uh, complete document. You go through it, you know, several times before you, before you uh, publish. Um, what is your writing process and what do you do? Um, because I'm sure a lot of people want to know, what do you do where you get what is called writer's block, right? Yeah, I'll say this. Writer's block, I don't want to, I don't want to diminish writer's block. Writer's block is a very real thing, but I also think uh, writer's block is, for me, a hesitation or a pause in the ability to put language on the page. So it's an ability to produce language on a page, which isn't the whole of writing for me. We're all, anyone in here who writes, you included, we all have to be multiple things before we're writing. Before I sit down to write, I have to be, or at least alongside of my writing, I have to be a good sibling, a good son, a good dog owner. I don't like the word dog parent, which I'm like, I'm trying to work around. But this is for lack of a better term, good dog parent. Uh, a good lover of my curiosities. That's the most important thing, perhaps. Because if I don't find those things, if I don't fulfill those things, if I don't check those boxes, that's when I struggle to write the most. And when I go and turn away from those things, if I, for example, take my dog on a walk, and upon that walk, I see something, or perhaps see something through her eyes, that returns me to the page with a new curiosity and a new excitement, then I've circumvented what someone called writer's block. And so in doing that, it's important then to say, that turning away and chasing after one of the other parts of my full human self is an act of writing, because it serves the final, yes, Putting words on the page and creating a product is a part of writing, but I also think living a full life that allows you to return to the page with ease and comfort is also just as important in the process of writing. Which isn't to say that I could like take 10 walks and look at beautiful trees and then tell my editor I've finished my work, you know. But I'm saying that if I'm blocked from putting language on the page, my first question is always, how have I not lived well in some other pocket of my life and how can I chase after that for a little bit and see what it returns to me? Well, I'll, I'll say for me, um, the one thing that I try to do is I tend to free write. Yeah. And so I tend to write whatever is on my mind at that time. So if I'm writing a story and I really don't want to write this story because I don't like my editor, I will, I will literally type on a page, this is some bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why I have to write this story. Yeah. This, my editor is absolutely nuts. Yeah. And, and that tends to free up my brain to be able to write my story. And so that's my little trick of what I do. Um, I wouldn't suggest that you always would call your editor, you know, nasty names and say it's bullshit. But if they don't ever see it, then, you know? Well, you, can, you might make that mistake and leave it at the bottom of that's your story. <laughs> right? I would be too anxious. I would, yeah, I would definitely make that mistake. Right. So, you know, you, you tend to do that, but you know, you, you, you try to find some things to free up your mind, whether it is taking a walk, um, whether, it, whether it is reminding yourself about the other responsibilities you have, your children, and other things that make you happy. Um, it may be, like I said, writing other things on, on a piece of paper, but it is all about what frees your brain at that particular moment. Um, and it may be um, listening to music. You know, um, I, I know, again, for me, um, I try to write in a very ly lyrical kind of way, yeah. where there's a rhythmic pattern um, in, ter in terms of the track of um, me. So and so, um, it's like composing a song. Um, you don't hit your crescendo until the end. Um, and so, you know, you may have your beginning, but you don't know what your crescendo is going to be. And that's the point where you're saying, yeah. <laughs> right? That's when you're cursing out your editor. Right, or you're cursing out yourself. Yeah. Right, and so um, those are some of the, my little tricks. And so um, from there, I'm going to stop talking, and we're going to get to questions from you guys. There's so many shirts of bands I like in the audience. <laughs> Is that a little hottie hottie shirt? And someone has a fireworks shirt on. I saw up there somewhere. Three, remember your number. Four, five, let's stop there. Number one, come on, loud. How are you? Hey. 
Uh, so, so this is great just to uh, hear about your process. Um, so I will admit I'm, I've finished pregame and the first quarter, and I'm absolutely loving where I'm going. Thank you. Um, I love how you've added the clock into this. I feel like when we're getting down to like 10 seconds and I got the ball, I get to take a timeout real quick because maybe I just want to really think about what was yeah. just written over yeah. there. Um, so just kind of circling around that a little bit, what came first to you? Was it the clock or was it the words? It was, unfortunately, it was a clock because it presented this real problem for me. Um, I, and I didn't think that idea would work, actually. And I was only going to do it for the pregame section because I thought the pregame section, there's a just easy parallel of, you know, beginning with something and watching it diminish using hair as a metaphor. But then I thought, well, if that's only a pregame section and then the rest of the book is just like a normal, I feel like people would be like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, what happened to that thing? So the clock came first. And the problem with the clock coming first was that I, I get so fixated on structure, and normally I'm not, in poems I'm not like this, in poems I'm very language-led, but in nonfiction I can sometimes be so hyper-fixated on structure and shape that the language really just comes second, and so I was intensely beholden to this clock structure in a way that was making the language really rigid, and me doing this thing called, uh, that my editor, the brilliant mind, I look called authoritative sports voice, where I was just like recapping basketball games for some reason. <laughs> um, because my brain was thinking about the clock, and you know, um, and then, uh, I, I keep forgetting who did it. I think it's, I think it was Ross Gay to bring Ross in the room again. I sent the book to Ross and was like, hey, this clock isn't working. I think, I think I'm maybe not good enough to pull this off. And he told me this thing, he's like, well, you're good enough. You're just not utilizing language well. So maybe just write through it. Like write, take the clock away, take all these numbers away, write through the book, and then affix the clock to the language that exists. That was a perfect bit of advice. So the first quarter, that is now the fourth quarter. Um, that was the other thing, is that my impulse was to run the book backwards and have it begin in 2016, and then, so the countdown was working all the way through the book, but that was like, that was the hardest possible draft to make, but it also wasn't the best book. And I had to, I got to a point where I had to ask myself the question, do you want to show off or do you want to write a good book? Because, yeah, I did the hardest possible thing with the first draft of this book, but it just wasn't as good. And I felt, yeah, I felt like proud of myself. But you don't, you don't want to feel overly proud of yourself in a first draft phase. That's, I think, a, you know. One last thing I'll say on this is, I was talking to a dear friend of mine who's not a writer, who's very analytics, very tiny, which is why I love her. She's like a, a math analyst. And while I was working on the first draft, I was telling her, like, you know, I think I'm, I feel like I'm writing the best work of my career. Like, this is, I don't know what's going on. This is like, wow. And she said, that's great, but like, shouldn't you be getting better? <laughs> and I was like, actually, yeah, I mean, I guess. And that was a real, that was maybe the best editing note I got in the process, because I went into the second draft, like, I can't be very impressed with myself, because I, you know, do I want to be impressed with myself, or do I want to write a good book? You know, that was, and so the clock came first, but it didn't last long in that form. Number two. Hi. 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 Um, it's funny, because, I was going to ask about first drafts, and maybe this has to do with my inexperience about writing. I'm not a writer. Um, but your book, They Can't Kill Us If They Kill Us, just like knocked me off my feet. I thought it was like the most concentrated emotion I had read in a book in a really long time. And so I romanticize it in my head as if you're like sitting in a room like in a fever dream, just like, and it all just kind of pours out, and there it is. It's kind of close with that one. That's actually kind of close with that one, yeah. So that's what I want your answer to be. I, my question is, how much of your writing is, like, do you have any first draft writing in any of your published works? And, like, if you oh. do, does it come to mind? I mean, I wrote, I wrote Fall Out Boy forever in an hour. And that's what's, what it is is what it is. Um, Bruce Springsteen's America, I wrote in an hour and 30 minutes, and that is what it is. The, the prints, I mean, they can't kill us, so they kill us. The unpublished portions of that book were written in two weeks, um, which was not very healthy. I mean, the mythology they can't kill us, so they kill us has grown, I think. And now I feel like I read somewhere where uh, my friend sent me a thing that was maybe on like Tumblr or some shit. They're like, I already wrote this book in four days. <laughs> it was two weeks, but it was also two very unhealthy weeks, like very unhealthy weeks. I was writing the book to stay alive, you know, like very literally to stay alive. Uh, to me, the process of that book was to survive and survive and survive. So I will say that, but there's also, um, <laughs> I have a quick print story about talking about first drafts. So 
Do people remember the Friday before Prince died? Most people don't. But there was, a, is anyone at all? Do you remember the scare on the plane? There was a scare on the plane the Friday before Prince died. And his plane landed and it was like an emergency landing and whatever. And at the time I was working on TV News and my editor was Jessica Hopper, the great Jessica Hopper, mentor of mine who I adore. And she calls me on Friday evening and is like, you know, Prince might be dead if you wanna, we probably need you to go home and write something. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but can you write, write up something in about 30 minutes? And I was on a date at the time. And she was like, but no one knew that you, you know, this was like very low key news. And she was like, you can't tell anyone because we want to have something out first. So I had to like find a way to maneuver out of this date without telling my date that Prince was maybe dead. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I gotta, you know, I was like, I gotta go home, you know. Like, I didn't even have a dog at the time, so I couldn't like lie about a dog. Like, I forgot the excuse I used. Um, weirdly enough, we went on a second date. I could not believe that. I was like, I'm not that good looking. I'm not that cool. You know what I mean? Why would you do this? She's very nice. We're actually still friends. Uh, that said, I went home and wrote that Prince piece in 30 minutes in um, the, the Walk on Water thing at the Super Bowl. And then, of course, he died on Monday. And that piece went up, and people were like, man, you had to. That piece went up like immediately. And people were like, he had to have that already. And I lied about it for a long time. I was like, no, nah, I just wrote that shit like this morning, you know? <laughs> uh, but it, I had that. I had that, yeah. Number three. Three things come to mind. 
One is definitely the work that PSA Lane did mm -hmm. 10 years ago with Andre yes. Brown. Another is the Ross Gay, like Ron Pixie interview, where he talks about his best, like his pickup basketball game. Just ridiculous. Where it, it ends with. I, it, 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 yeah, I have a lot of it's like I have a lot of flaws. So the question you. was like, what weaknesses? Do you what have weaknesses? Today? Yeah. He said lots of weaknesses, fewer than fewer than, yours. fewer than yours. Yeah. <laughs> and when I think about that Kiese Lehman piece, one of the things that DeAndre says to Kiese is like, "Hey, I am working on my game every day. I'm doing. I'm working. I'm happy. I'm doing what I love. I get to do it every day." And when you talk about this question of like collective definitions of what making it means, there's also this question of like individually, yeah. do we get to define what it means to make it? And I think about the line from, or like at the beginning of the Crown and Fourth Much, you talk about Josephine Baker and yeah, yeah, yeah. names, yes. and this question of like the importance of names and how hard it is to make one, but once you make one, the awe that comes. And I'm just curious, like, you've done so much over the years, how are you starting to think about, not just this question of collectively, what does it mean to make it, but individually? Um, and how might you help other folks that are looking to be a young, heavy, right, starting out in the game, um, how might they set those definitions as well? Yeah, I think for, well, one, I love Ross so much. I get to see him virtually on Thursday, which is only sad because I would love to see him in person. But one time, is I know I feel bad asking questions about my own, but the weather basketball essay is in the book, right? Um, uh, no, it's not. It's not. It didn't make it. Oh, that's a bummer. It's online. But I wrote this essay about love and basketball, where I kind of give myself a self scouting report in my own basketball game. I'm like, I'm doing the pick and roll of someone. And I wrote that piece, and it came out. I'll never forget this. It came out on a Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. At 10.15 a.m., I get an email from one Ross Gay, <laughs> no subject line. And it's just, are you really good with pick and roll? I need a partner. I need a, like, I, I lost my, you know, I guess like one of his, his like two on two partner just like transferred to another university. So if you ever want to come to Indiana, I need a new guy. <laughs> so that, that's Ross um, in a nutshell. Uh, also very elbowy, I've heard. We've never played together, but he's like very aggressive elbow. I believe in collective making it. I don't really have use for individual making it. But, or, 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 or like, I'm not naive, I understand. Under, again, like I understand. I understand that it's hard to say I'm not that interested in individual decoration after I've gotten a lot of it, yes. But what I mean is, You know, uh, there are a lot of reasons I think why the Johnny Cash cover of Hurt is so effective. But for me, I think the reason that is perhaps most effective is because it is sung by a person who knows he is going to die, not in some abstract sense, not in some sense where it's like, we're all going to die. He knew that he was going to die soon, very soon. And so when he says, you can have it all, you can have it all my entire dirt, that means something different than it, if it were to be a person in their 30s saying it, a person who, does not think about death in an immediate way with urgency. So what I mean is, I am already there when it comes to individual making it. My, I believe, collective, my urgency towards collective liberations or freedoms or making it or whatever it means, I want that to be my legacy because I don't want it to be only tied to me. Every month, I do a workshop with six or seven Columbus City Schools poets. We do this every year, all on Ontario. We meet one Sunday a month. They come for like two hours to talk about poems. We workshop each other's poems. They workshop my poems with the same rigor and intensity that I workshop theirs with because there's no hierarchy in the room. I'm not a parent. I'm not a teacher. We, we're all writers, so we just come to sit down and work. That's it. If I bring in some bullshit, they're actually required to tell me it's bullshit. I don't ever talk to them about, you know, if one of them loves a poet, like for example, one of them this year is like obsessed with Franny Choi, I would never be like, oh, I know Franny, because that would disrupt the, the idea of no hierarchy. We're all writers chasing after the thing, and I'm not trying to get them to be me or whatever. I think what I'm trying to do is say, I know that you are curious and eager writers who don't have resources in the classroom to, to help that flourish, because a lot of these schools are not built to help those creative minds flourish. Uh, and I'm also a writer who's trying to grow. And if you want to grow together, then we'll do that. 
And yeah, you might like look up in the paper and be like, oh, that's the dude I write with, and he's won something or whatever. But that doesn't mean you gotta stop pushing me because I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna stop pushing you. And I, I think that is perhaps the entire ethos of my hunger for collectively making it. I am from a city of a lot of brilliant artists, brilliant black artists who've come out of Columbus. I am operating the lineage of Amina Robinson, Scott Woods, Wally Neal, uh, on and so on, Richard Duarte Brown, so on and so on and so on. And if that were to end with me, if I were to say I'm going to take my awards and my decorations and just sit in my house and look at them, I would be failing, I think. I'd be fa I would be failing this place that I purport to love and the people in it who I love more than the place itself. And so I, I don't know. Um, I don't have much use for individual, individually making it. Though again, I'm grateful for having stumbled into some things. That, but in terms of like, I always joke that just like the material rewards, I literally, <laughs> I think it like a, uh, should I tell this? I'll tell them. Is this, this isn't being like recorded and broadcasted. Something about my chaotic book nightstand. Um, I keep a stack of books by my bed because I really love to read um, 45 minutes at night before sleeping and an hour in the morning. And then I'm like, this is been fucked up because I've been on book tours, so I haven't been able to do it. But the first Friday of every month, I, no matter what else is going on, I will stay in the house and just go to bed early, go to bed early with a bunch of books and poems and read for like three hours and do rigorous close reading and, and pleasurable reading and um, and I take that seriously. I mean, I'm like, I've turned down like, you know, real plans to do that because if I don't, if I turn away from that, I think it'll fall apart and I need that, that particularly Friday night thing, I need that structure uh, once a month to really ground me in my reading practice to say like, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter if like, 1990s version of Sade, I do, comes to my door and is like, let's go on a date on Friday. I'll be like, I'm so, unfortunately, first off, how did you get here? Second off, uh, I have to read tonight. So, how about tomorrow? <laughs> if the time machine still works. Oh, let's do one, one, two, come on, one, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. You gotta welcome me here, because it's gonna be a while. So I started the audio with Wild and playing, and I almost just cracked up because there's a passage about LeBron James's like hair and how it's just been like fading for the past decade or so. Um, so me, I'm glad I'm glad to walk in, but I'm also trying to be alive. So I mean, I'm a joke that like as he's retiring, he's 40, and the Caroline finally gonna go and you're tired, like it's a whole thing. That's your card. But what really interested me about that passage and the discussion around the hair of people change the road and other stuff is this new trend in the NBA where like we're seeing the return of like that Iverson like core yes. like, the braids and you know, the John Morant and kind of all these different natural hair stuff that are coming in. Um, I don't know if you answered this in the book, but I'm not that far, but I'm curious like what is your inkling of the disposition of specifically like black men and black men athletes and how their hair is now coming from the freshman. You know, it was wild. It was so wild to grow up in the era of the NBA where, like, David Stern was heavily policing black men's hair because if you turn even briefly towards women's ball, it was, like, the exact opposite for black women. I mean, it still is now, you know what I mean? Like, to, to the degree that, like, say someone, <laughs> I'm thinking about, like, Aaliyah Boston, who's just kind of like a tornado of multicolored, you know, braids, and that's, and that's just also been women, women's ball for so long. And so I think there's a way that I feel like um, what we're seeing now is not, the Iverson thing felt like it was acting in harsh response to a kind of punishing of, of expression, right? And what we're seeing now I think is a lot more free and a lot more joyful. And um, NBA hair goes through its phases, or basketball hair goes through its phases. I, you know, I grew up in the early 90s where it was like baldness was the, the early phase. And then Iverson happened in Corn Rose and, and now we're kind of back towards this really uh, beautiful mode of, like big afros are kind of back, you know? That's beautiful. And I'm waiting for someone to like play in a perm or like a... <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy Butler did take us. Jimmy Butler, yes! He did take us. Uh, 
his fault? Yes, it's, it's, it's in a media day photo. Yes. Yeah. But the one thing I'll add about here is that uh, <laughs> guys now are, are, are paid well enough to be able to pay the fine. So, That's real. So, so if you're, you're making $192 million, what's another $10,000 to the NBA to be able to wear my hair anywhere I want to? Also, the fact, I mean, like, let's be real. We're all, we're all adults here. <laughs> the NBA uniform comes away from racism. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, whatever. It's all racism. Uh, and the roots of the NBA trying to appeal to quote unquote white audiences in the early 80s, all of that was racist. Yes, I, that's not diminishing like Magic Johnson and the way that he really altered the game and the, the way that fans came to the game. But this idea that like we had to have that kind of appeal started this David Stern era, or what would become the David Stern era of like, we have to keep our white fans so we don't want to scare them. And I think that maybe we're now we're operating a little bit outside of that. One last, and then we're going to have a group talk. <laughs> Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I think we are both in your writing to go ahead and write excellent books. Thank, Thank you for writing that. I just have a question. What are your thoughts on Cowboy Carter? <laughs> 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 it's, um, it is good. I, I'm trying carefully. Uh, I think it's a touch long. A little long. Uh, I'm wondering if it could have been edited a touch. But it's also a Beyonce record, so like there are highs on that record that I think no one else can touch right now in the realm of popular music. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I was. I, was, I will say this just structurally and lyrically and shape-wise, I was really looked down by the Jolene thing. It just didn't work for me because I think uh, one, Dolly Parton's writing of Jolene is so thoughtful from a perspective point of view. Just talk about like enemies, the way I frame enemies in the book. But every now and then, a photo of Dolly Parton in the 70s will hit the internet. In the <laughs> 60s or 70s, and people's response is always what? It's always like, if Dolly was looking like that, what the fuck could Jolene have possibly look like? <laughs> you know, that's actually not the function of the song from Dolly's point of view. The function of the song is, this person, Jolene, is someone who poses a threat because she wants my man, and my man might take her up on those advances. So therefore, you're not witnessing Jolene from the perspective of a, a bystander. You're witnessing, in the song Jolene, you're witnessing Jolene through the eyes of Dolly Parton, who views Jolene as a threat, therefore Jolene looks like a, anything that Dolly Parton wants her to look like, right? It doesn't actually matter what Jolene looks like, looks like. It matters what the speaker of the song sees as a threat to her part. Although, you know, the old adage is like, if you're a man, you be taken, you don't got a man anyway, you know? <laughs> that's, that's, or that, I mean, I believe that. Personally. Well, maybe I don't believe it. I don't know. It's none of my business. <laughs> none of this is my business. Jolene's probably like a fine woman. Uh, but I will say, yeah, I, I didn't like the Jolene thing a whole lot. The songs I love with Cowboy Carter are very good. I'd be interested to see a, a, a visual tour thing or visuals or something else. I think if I'm like ranking Beyonce album, it's probably not in my top five, but that's fine because the top five is like bulletproof, I think. You know? And there are some artists who I think should have the, the longitude and latitude to kind of just fuck around at this point, you know? Um, and so that is my generous review of Catholic Arts. It's really, I'm, I'm glad, I'm very glad she made it. Okay, well, we're gonna close it out. Let's give Hanifa a round of applause. Can I read a small thing? Can I read a small thing? Yes. I feel bad because I, I would love to read a small thing. Can I read from there? Just on that, okay. Thank you for, for sure. <laughs> this mic's on. Um, I do want to thank y'all again for bearing with me today. Um, I was feeling not very great about not being here on time, and now I feel a bit better, so thank you. Um, I'm going to read. I'm gonna read like a five minute thing. In Cleveland, they burned LeBron James's jerseys when he left, and a friend of mine went to go throw 
the jersey and the fire. Um, or no, you know what? I'm gonna read about planes and my dad. It was my dad's birthday last week. And complicated as that relationship is, it was really great to, um, I don't know, have an awkward birthday phone call with him, <laughs> as we do sometimes. And um, yeah, thank you again for listening to me. Let me find this. Oh, also, I hope there's still time for me to sign books, perhaps, um, because I would like to do that. So I think one thing that people forget about because it hasn't happened in so long um, is that you, can, you used to be able to walk up to the airport and watch planes take off. Um, like you used to just be able to walk to wherever planes took off, sit in the grass and watch it happen. This was pre-9-11 America. Um, and post-9-11 America, you could not do that anymore. But I used to do it with my dad, and it was like, a, it's a core formal memory of, of mine. So I am going to read uh, about that. Thank you all again for listening to me. There were years before the fences crowned with barbed wire. Years before the monochromatic manufacturing plants began to sprawl, before concrete was poured over the grass, over the brightest shouts of the yellow flowers, before the parking lots and the cars flooding the lots so tightly one could barely walk among them. Mostly, though, it was a time before the simplest, most mundane pleasures could be governed by fear. And in those years, when I was still young, my father would take my brother and me to a field that pushed right up against the airport. It is hard to imagine now, because of all the aforementioned architecture designed to keep people away, but you could walk right up to the airport in those days. The Greenbrier housing projects were next to it, and our complex was just down the street. We'd drive, but if one wanted to, one could, in fact, walk straight onto the field, sit in the tall grass, lean among the flowers, and watch the planes take off. We'd always go at sunset, mostly on Fridays after my father got off work. It was one of the rare times with my father that demanded silence, no speaking, no music pushing the limits of stereo speakers in a car or living room. You were so close to the runway at the airport that you could feel the ground tremble when a plane was preparing to take off. That is how you knew to look up. The soil would jump slightly, brown specks spilling over onto the brown hand pushed against the earth, and then moments later, the reveal from behind the airport tower or a single building interrupting the sky, a plane would emerge, the front of it tilting back, a mouth drinking in the sun's final offerings. Brightness collapsing atop another more alarming brightness, a metal machine, large and loud at first, and then smaller, smaller, silent, gone. And at that age, I never thought there were people inside of the planes. I never imagined anyone leaving anywhere or who they might be leaving behind. It all just seemed like a show, no different than the explosion of fireworks, temporary decorations before the sky went black. Would it help here for me to tell you that my father was a man who left one place to make home someplace else? New Jersey, and then New York, and then Ohio. He and my mother and my two older siblings left and came to Columbus because that's where adults could find jobs. Migration is sometimes a requirement, an act of survival. I never thought of my father as longing for a return to anywhere, which is, of course, what a child believes even while sitting beside a man who has made a ritual of silence, a man who made a ritual of looking up and watching planes take people from a place he was to any place he wasn't. It was never actually the leaving that fascinated me as a child beside my father in the grass, looking up at the darkening sky, the beautiful in-between of the sun, trying its best to hold on, trying its best to admire the work of its own descent before the angels of nighttime opened their pockets and dot the darkness with stars. The leaving was special enough, planes tilting upward, upward, gone, but it was the returning that gently opened my mouth into a sort of ever-widening crescent, the wind parading softly through the gaps left where what my mother called my sweet little baby teeth had once been, but then they were gone, another glistening and bright treasure lost to the morning. In my sleep, I'd swallowed one of the teeth. I had been playing with it the night before, pushing it back and forth with my tongue, listening to the small click of it like its own metronome, and in the morning, it was gone. I couldn't find it anywhere. I suppose, I don't know for sure if I swallowed it in my sleep, but that is a story I've told for years, since no other story makes sense. I woke up with another one in my palm one morning, like it fell out in the middle of the night, and I refused to let it go, like I had always desired proof of love. 
moss, another tumbling out in the sink during the brushing of my teeth, and finally, the most violent of removals. I spilled off of a bright red skateboard that I should have never been on, something one of the older boys in the adjacent projects let me play with. I hit my face on the curb. I was five years old, an age where pain is sometimes defined not by what you feel, but by what you see, how much and where it's coming from. In the tiny oceans of blood running along the sidewalk, there was a single white tooth, a single white rose reaching beyond a field of red, field of red and none of this loss mattered, I was assured, because there would be new teeth coming. These were simply casualties, the exits that come with aging, and so it was never the leaving. I was born into an obsession with returns. Something or someone leaves you, but you'll get something or someone back. Sometimes it's an even exchange. You kiss a person goodbye when they go away for a few days, and they come back to you, the same person they were when they left. Other times, you lose a part of your childhood, and something harder grows in its place. But hey, a return is a return. Sometimes the sky would be calm for a bit, and the fields would be silent, and then a plane would emerge. If it was dark enough, you would first notice it by a blinking red light upsetting the black, and then the belly of it would grow larger as it got low and low enough for you to see the windows, some of them open low enough that you might think you could reach up and run a hand along the metal wings, and I thought of this as its own kind of magic. For a while, I was so young and so enraptured that I believed the same plane that just vanished into the sky was coming right back down, like it gave the people a small show, and now they were returning to the people in places they loved. I swear, it was simpler that way. Thank you all so much for hanging out.